Hello, my name is Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Walter Kay, who is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the founder and executive director of the Eating Disorders Program at the Eating Disorders Center for Treatment and Research at UC San Diego. Dr. Kay is a co-editor in the Clinical Handbook of Complex and Atypical Eating Disorders and Behavioral Neurobiology of Eating Disorders. He is a leading expert in eating disorders and is here to discuss some of the new research in the field of treatment. Dr. Kay, welcome to The Therapy Show. Oh, thank you very much. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your research in the field of eating disorders? Yeah, certainly. I first trained as a neurologist and then trained in psychiatry a number of years ago, and I've always been interested in doing research. I didn't particularly have an interest in eating disorders, but I got a fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health. And when I went there, I was asked to take over a study on anorexia. And actually, in my training, I had never met anybody with anorexia. And at the time, I was particularly interested in trying to understand how behavior was encoded in the brain. And so I was thinking about studying some disorders like Parkinson's that have certain changes in behavior. And we know that that's due to neurologic disturbances. And in treating people with anorexia, I was really struck by how what we call stereotypic their behavior is. That is, people with anorexia resemble each other much more so than probably any other psychiatric disorder in terms of people resembling each other. For example, if you have schizophrenia, People have all kinds of different symptoms, but people with anorexia tend to have the same, relatively the same symptoms. And, you know, that should make you think that there's something in the brain that's causing this. Uh, So that has actually been what got me interested in in studying brain and biology and anorexia. I was at NIMH for about seven years, and I went to the University of Pittsburgh for 20 years. And And now I'm here at the University of California, San Diego, where I do research and also I uh, oversee the treatment program for anorexia and bulimia. So how would you briefly explain eating disorders to a non-professional? There's a number of ways to explain it. I think that's what really confuses people because people with anorexia often, but not all the time, see themselves as being too fat and they go on a relentless pursuit of thinness. Uh, And actually, the other disorder that we treat very often is bulimia nervosa, which is where people kind of alternate between restricted eating and overeating and then sometimes purging. And people also have a body image distortion. But these are disorders that are often also associated with things like anxiety and obsessionality. And people have a certain pattern of temperament traits. These tend to be perfectionistic, sometimes obsessive, uh, anxious people. And so this has been very, very puzzling because eating disorders tend to start mostly in females around early teenage, mid teenage years. And so the Prevailing notion is that this is a disorder that's caused by culture or society and people are are dieting to achieve some kind of desired look. But the reality is that people with anorexia diet to a weight that they could be 50, 60 pounds and, and nobody would consider that to be fashionably slim. In fact, people with anorexia, when they get to that weight, they still see themselves often as being too fat and and they want to pursue a lower weight. And the other thing that's really noticeable about anorexia is that it's very hard for people to diet and lose weight. The recidivism rate in obesity is very high. And to be able to eat a few hundred calories a day every day for years at a time is not something that most people can do. We've really been very interested in the question of whether there's really an underlying biology that explains a lot of these puzzling symptoms that you see in anorexia and bulimia. Can you talk about what's happening in the brain and the body when a person has an eating disorder? Well, there's two levels of it. One is the question of whether there is some underlying biology that causes an eating disorder. And then the second part is, gee, what happens when you starve yourself and what effects does that have on the brain and the body? 
Let's talk mostly about anorexia because that's really where I do most of my research. People with anorexia go on this this kind of relentless diet and they may be 12, 14, 15 years old when they start it. But if you ask somebody with anorexia what they were like as a child before they ever developed an eating disorder, what most of the time they'll tell you is that they have a certain pattern of temperament and personality traits. These tend to be, as children, they're very achievement-oriented. They want to get all A's. They tend to be often kind of perfectionistic. They may be anxious and worried about what might happen, concerned about risk, uh, inhibited, sometimes very obsessional and organized, sometimes kind of inflexible. But these are, for the most part, this isn't a problem for them. They're parents, they're pretty compliant kids. They do well in school. They, but something happens when, you know, they start to get in these teenage years and often they have exaggerated anxiety. And what they'll often tell you is there's something about food or wanting to eat food that makes them very anxious and something about not eating them either makes doesn't increase the anxiety or it actually feels kind of empowering. And so they get into this, because food is so uncomfortable for them, uh, they get into this escalating downward spiral where the more weight they lose, the more weight they want to lose, and they can literally starve themselves to death. In fact, this disorder has the highest death rate of any behavioral disorder. It's thought that somewhere between 5 and 10 percent and Maybe even more people with anorexia will die from the anorexia. And so once you start to starve yourself and lose weight like this, there's a whole host of secondary changes that occur in the body as your body is trying to uh, conserve energy and live with very few calories. And it affects uh, nearly every organ system in the body as you lose weight. So it's been very hard to tease apart what's the cause and what's the consequence of anorexia. Now, over the course of this disorder, what we find is that a group of people recover and somewhere probably around about 50% of people eventually recover and may do very well in life. Uh, But it's not unusual that people may be ill with anorexia for two or five or even 10 years before they get better. And about Maybe about 30% or so have a partial recovery, and then you have a group of people that have a very chronic disorder or die from it. And the thing that's really the most concerning thing to recognize is we don't really have very powerful treatments for anorexia. There's no medication that's been proven to work. We have some treatments that seem to work more effectively in adolescents and children with anorexia. It's uh, it's called family-based treatment or Mosley. You can go back and talk a little bit more about that. But even with that treatment, it's very hard to change this anxious behavior that happens when people eat. And so it's very important to really understand the biology and the mechanisms underlying this behavior in order to come up with more effective kinds of therapy, both to keep people from being ill for many, many years before they get better or to prevent them from becoming chronically ill or dying from this illness. For bulimia, can you talk a little bit about the body image symptoms and also is there a secondary gain that somebody might experience from binging and purging? Human behavior is complicated and as similar as people with anorexia are to each other, everybody's an individual and there's probably always a mixture of different kinds of environmental and biologic factors that contribute to anybody developing a disorder like this. People with bulimia, why do people binge and purge? Well, people with bulimia often tell you that when they're stressed or upset or anxious, have a fight with their mother or something like that, there's something about binging or purging behavior that actually is kind of comforting and may make the uncomfortable feelings go away, at least temporarily, even though in the long run they return and they may feel worse. So there, just like with anorexia, there, there's some beneficial response to extremes of food intake or extremes of not eating food. And now that we're beginning to understand more about the brain, some of the biology about this, 
begins to make sense. And with some people with bulimia, because people with bulimia often stay around a more normal weight, the body image issues may be part of what is also driving their desire to to lose weight and to to remain at a certain what they consider ideal body weight. So it's complicated. But again, most people with bulimia don't get to the extremes of weight loss that you see in anorexia. And of course, there's actually a third disorder here, which are people that have both a mixture of anorexia and bulimia, and they lose a lot of weight, but they also binge and purge. Eating disorder behaviors are often very secretive. Are there any signs or symptoms that a family can look for in the early stages of illness that can help them? You see two different kind of patterns here. In people with bulimia that don't lose an extreme amount of weight, they often tell you they're ashamed and distressed about binging and purging, and they tend to be the most secretive. They're the people that nobody in the family will know that they're binging and purging, they're doing this at night, or they're hiding, or they're any number of things that people do to keep it a secret from their family. And this may go on for years. And sometimes it's very hard to discover and the family begins to notice that there's large amounts of food missing or that the toilet has gotten clogged up by vomitus. You know, one of the things that happens when people binge or purge to an extreme, it may affect their menstrual periods and they stop having menstrual periods or they may be very irregular. We see a very different pattern in anorexia and people with anorexia don't usually try and hide it, they have more of a a denial that they don't see themselves as being too thin. In fact, even though they may lose 30, 40 pounds, they'll look at their arm and hold their arm out and say, can't you see how fat I am? And they're not really very motivated to get into treatment. There's a lot of denial, a lot of resistance to being in therapy and sometimes frank hostility to trying to get them into treatment. And that's, of course, one of the problems with anorexia because it can be a life-threatening illness, yet there's a group of people that don't feel that they're at any risk. Why is early intervention critical for people suffering with eating disorders? This goes back to a couple of different reasons. One, there there is some evidence that the earlier you get somebody into treatment, the better they might do. So the most effective treatment we have, particularly for anorexia, is called family-based treatment or Maudsley. And because this can be a very chronic disorder and People get into treatment or forced into treatment and forced to gain weight, but they leave treatment and they lose that weight all over again. And they may go through repeated cycles So, because most families are unable to keep their child in a treatment program for a long period of time. And because this is a chronic disorder, this therapy has been effective because it makes parents an ally. Instead of saying to parents, you're bad people, you've caused this, there's really no evidence that their families cause eating disorders or bad parenting causes eating disorders. You want to bring them in as an ally and try and explain to them reasons why your child is acting this way. And more importantly, that make the parents part of the treatment team. So once their child goes home, the parents has strategies and knows how to most effectively get them to eat and maintain their weight. And that treatment has really been a game changer in that there's been a number of studies that have shown that it, it's a more effective treatment for many people, especially if they're younger than older treatments as usual. But say that there's a large proportion of people that don't really respond very well to family-based treatment and go on to have a chronic disorder. And so that's one of the reasons we need to learn more about the biology so that we come up with more effective uh, approaches here. But what happens to people when they get malnourished? Well, there are certain systems in the body that growth during teenage years is very important. And so one of those is bone strength. And actually your bones continue to develop and, and get stronger during your teenage years and your bone growth becomes peak in you know, late teens, early 20s. And then it's you slowly lose bone strength as you get older. If you miss that critical period of bone growth, you're gonna you're likely to have weak bones all your life. You can't make up for it later when you with better nutrition when you're in your twenties and thirties. And it's not unusual that we see people who have had a period of anorexia and now are fully recovered, but they suffer. They're very susceptible to fractures as they get into their thirties and forties that other people might not have. 
just because their bones are so weak. And there's other patterns, similar kind of patterns of growth that occur in parts of the brain during your teenage years, getting into your 20s. And now we're beginning to wonder whether there may be permanent changes in some, some parts of the brain if people remain malnourished for many years. There are long-term consequences that can happen. And even people that have bulimia nervosa that don't lose a lot of weight can also show some of these more chronic permanent changes. I like the way you talk about the family as, as part of the treatment team. And I think that a multidisciplinary approach is key to treating someone with an eating disorder, even including like when we think about the medical, the dental, the psychiatric, and the psychotherapy piece. I think they're all critical, don't you think? Absolutely. It it takes a team to treat somebody with anorexia, a dietitian, uh, various kinds of therapy, sometimes medication. Family is just maybe the most critical element of that whole team. So what are some of the most common obstacles that prevent people from achieving a full recovery? I don't think we really know that. And that's where you start to get into biology. One of the questions that we've really struggled with and particularly are doing research on is this question about eating behavior. Let me ask you, how how do you feel when you go without eating for a day or two? Angry. (laughs) Yeah, most people will say there's something unpleasant about it. It's irritable. It's uncomfortable. It just doesn't feel good. And what people will find if you go without eating for a day or two and you get hungry, that first bite of food really is more pleasurable. It'll still be pleasurable, but when you're really hungry, food tastes better, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So if you ask somebody with anorexia what they feel like when they have to eat or they think about food, you know, what they'll almost always tell you is there's something about that that makes them anxious and uncomfortable. And when they don't eat, they feel the anxiety is, isn't increased, or as I said, sometimes they feel even better empowered. Just from that standpoint, it makes you think that there's something that's wired very differently in people's brain with anorexia, because the primary job of animals is to find food and feed themselves every day. And we know from animal studies, there's very powerful systems that are built into the brain to do that. So what happens is when animals go without eating for a while, their body says to sense that they need energy stores or energy stores are diminished. Their gas tank is less full. And that there's a number of different pathways in the brain that send messages, signals to the, to the brain that say, God, you need more energy. And what that does is that really, you know, in human, that's interpreted as uncomfortable feelings. Hey, there's something wrong. You got to go out and eat. And in animals, what that clearly does is that works on a part of the brain that's very important for reward and motivation. And it actually sends a signal to that part of the brain that motivates you to go out and search for food. So we know a lot about that part of the brain. It's it's very deep in the brain. It's shared with animals. It's actually below our, our consciousness. It, it's a part of the brain that sits on top of the brain stem, but under the cortex, and it's called the striatum or the basal ganglia. And it's very important for motivating all kinds of behavior, whether it's food or drugs or sex or anything that people are, and animals are motivated to do. And you can do brain imaging studies now that early ask the question of what happens in that part of the brain? Does the activity in that part of the brain that's important for motivation get turned on when you're hungry? And so we did a study, and this was just published a couple of months ago in the American Journal of Psychiatry, where we had people with anorexia come into a laboratory we have on campus, a, a building, a setting, and they lived there for three days. And on one day, we had them go without eating for 16 hours. On the other day, we had them eat normally. And what we want to do is measure the activity in this motivational part of the brain. And so we had them come in and after that, they they came into our imaging center and we imaged their brain and and we had them, we put a little plastic tube in their mouth and we had them taste, repeated taste of, of sugar water, which we know kind of turns on the system. And what we found is that in the control women, the women that didn't have anorexia, we found exactly what we Others have found on on the day that they were hungry, there was much more activity in this motivational center in the brain than there was on the day they were full. Uh, No surprise. 
And we did the same thing in people with anorexia. And what we found is that on the day that they were fed, they looked just like the controls. On the day they were hungry, there was decreased activity in the motivation center. So this makes perfect sense. And it, what it's really saying is that people with anorexia, the reason they can starve themselves is that they're just not getting a signal that's compelling them to go out and eat food. Does, does that kind of make sense? It does. Now, are they motivated to do anything else, like to do other things like c- compulsive behaviors? We've looked at other kinds of motivation, which is things like response to money, and they have the same diminished signal in the part of the brain. So, you know, people that are actually like to save money, they don't spend money. And so they're not really motivated to for any kind of reward. And that's actually we think is part of the problem with with treatment is that they really have a hard time sensing the reward of it. You know, parents try and motivate their kids all the time to eat and maintain their weight by promising them, I'll buy you a new Porsche. Treatment is so expensive, it's probably cheaper to buy them a Porsche. And and it doesn't work because people with anorexia tend to be very insensitive to reward. But the converse side of it is that they're oversensitive to things going wrong, to what we call punishment, some kind of aversive risk state. In fact, the other thing that we found in this study is that the more anxious the people with anorexia were, the more activity they showed in this part of the brain that's very sensitive to things going wrong and inhibit behavior. And actually, what we think is going on is that if you're an animal out there in the wild, you're a rabbit, you're living out there in a field, you're living in your little hole in the ground, it's relatively safe, you start to get hungry, the hunger is going to motivate you to go out and look for food, right? But animals have to have a system built into their brain that inhibits that behavior if there's something dangerous going on, like a predator that might eat it. And so even though that rabbit is very hungry, that rabbit has to inhibit that hunger and motivation to eat and run away if there's some kind of risk going on, some kind of danger. And what we th- I think is going on with people with anorexia is they're getting kind of a biased signal here. They're oversensitive to things going wrong, danger, anxiety, adversity, change, uncertainty, all those things that give you a a signal there's some kind of risk. And they're actually getting a signal in their brain. They're somehow miscoding food and they're miscoding food as being dangerous and risky. And that doesn't exist for the rest of us because nobody is wired that way. But there's something very different about the brain of people with anorexia. Does that kind of make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I just wonder what the cause is. Do you have any theories of the cause of where that began? Well, now that we're beginning to understand what system is involved in the brain, we think that there's something wrong in this mechanism that balances reward and punishment. And people with anorexia tend to be very sensitive to punishment and risk and things like that. What exactly the chemical mechanism of that is still a mystery, but I think we're starting to understand where to look now. That's really hopeful and promising. So is there anything that improves treatment outcomes? We're finding that some people, and there have been some articles now in the literature, part of the system it relies on a chemical called dopamine, which actually people think of as a reward chemical, but it's actually very important for this balance between reward and punishment. And that there's some studies suggesting that at least some people with anorexia may respond to some drugs that work on the dopamine system. There was a paper in the American Journal last year uh, showing that Cyprexa, also called Dilanzapine, improved weight gain to some extent in people with anorexia. And there's been several other studies showing that a drug called Abilify, which kind of has a similar mechanism, or aripiprazole, also might be work on some people. It doesn't work on everybody. It's not a magic bullet, but it, it may be helpful for some people. We really need to do now more controlled studies of that. But at least it's starting to open the door to ask questions about uh, mechanisms. Oh, by the way, I want to mention one other thing. The thing that's really important about the study I just told you about is we studied people who had recovered from anorexia, not people that were ill. And the reason that we did that is is this problem with teasing apart cause and effect. And if you study people that are ill and malnourished with anorexia, wouldn't be surprising you get 
alter signals in this system. And we wanted to look at people at a normal weight, not on medication, normal menstrual function, doing really well in life. And we found that they still had a disturbance in this system and suggesting that this may be the trait that leads to anorexia in the first place. Are there other mental disorders that often co-occur with eating disorders? The one that seems to be the most common is anxiety or and obsessive compulsive disorder. But people also have depression and they may have a number of other disorders too. So do people with eating disorders have a higher rate of suicide? Unfortunately, they do. I mean, that's part of the increased death rate, uh, you know, mortality rate in anorexia. Is some people starve themselves to death, but some people commit suicide. And another reason why we need more effective treatments. Why is it important that clinicians who are treating people with eating disorders are trained in the most up-to-date research and treatments? Just because of the difficulty of, of treating this disorder and the difficulty of even getting people to participate and engage in treatment, the more we learn about anorexia and, and the symptoms that people have, I think the better we can speak people's the language and the way you know, understand the way people are thinking and reach out to them and get them to be motivated and engage in treatment. And I think one of the problems that we've had with Anorexia and often psychiatric disorders is that you try and there's theories about behavior and maybe they make a lot of sense, but maybe they don't. And if you try and use a theory that really has no particular, it doesn't fit or explain why somebody has a disorder, it's less likely to result in any kind of effective therapy. So, for example, now that we understand this altered balance between reward and punishment, we can work with families on that strategy. And we explain this to families who say, look, rewarding your child isn't going to be that effective, but they're, these are kids that worry about consequences and don't want to do things wrong or make mistakes or And we can help families develop strategies to use consequences. Not that we're we're not trying to punish their kids. It's just that sometimes they pay much more attention to that and to realize that if they don't eat and maintain their weight, there's going to be consequences they consider even worse. And that becomes very individualized because you want to figure out what consequences bother that child the most. But we're finding that can be somewhat a more successful kind of strategy. That's incredible. So to use consequences to get the attention and to sort of start the conversation with the young person or whoever you're treating, that's excellent. For example, kids with anorexia, yeah, they really don't want to go back into treatment. <laughs> they don't want to go in the hospital. They don't want to go into you know, a residential program. And sometimes that's the only leverage that you have. Not great, but you have to work with what you got. And I think if you're not trained in understanding eating disorders, I want to ask you to explain to our audience, eating disorders are different. They're almost like distinct disorders, like bulimia is a distinct disorder and anorexia nervosa are distinct disorders. I mean, we call them all feeding disorders, but they're complex and they're different. (laughs) They're both very different and they actually sometimes have some similarities. And one of the puzzling things is that both anorexia and bulimia are run in families. So one person can have anorexia, another can have bulimia. Yeah, I don't think we really understand this. And if you're a clinician who's working in the field, who's been certified, and I think you also understand that some people need multiple treatment, like multiple treatment centers or multiple um, residential treatment to get better. And whereas a person who's not experienced might see that as they're failing or they're not getting it the first time. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that's very important is that when people get malnourished, they actually, their symptoms tend to get worse and they spiral out of control and they have difficulty, their brain gets starved, they have difficulty learning things or using therapy. And and so for both mental as well as physical reasons, they need to get back to a healthy body weight. And that can really be a an enormous challenge for people with anorexia. And so being in a, you know, they often end up in a higher level of care because it's just so if you don't get them to a more healthy nutritional state, they may die from their anorexia. And also the other thing that's going on here is that some people with anorexia get very energy inefficient. And by that, I mean, there's been studies 
is showing, for example, people with obesity have a hard time losing weight and they seem to have an easy time getting the weight back after they lose weight. The opposite tends to occur seem to occur with a lot of people with anorexia. They they lose weight very easily and it's hard for them to gain weight. And sometimes they need thousands of calories a day to gain that weight back. And if you're somebody with anorexia and you want to eat 500 calories a day and you need three, 4,000 to gain weight, you know, two, three pounds a week, food is making you anxious. What's the chance they're going to be able to do that at home? Not mm-hmm. great. And they may have to eat that amount of food for two, three, four months to get back to a healthy body weight. So sometimes higher levels of care are, are just so critical to, to save their life. Exactly. Now, aren't people with anorexia and nervosa interested in food? I mean, I think there's a misconception that they're not interested in food, but do you think that they might have a preoccupation with food, perhaps? Absolutely. I mean, they collect calories, they cook for others, they window shop for food, they work in food industries. And I think this has been one of the puzzling parts. So this network, you you have a a brain circuit that's very important for recognizing you're hungry and driving the motivation to eat. And there's a series of kind of steps along the way that do that. And it's possible that you could have a blockage in one part of of that, which is, so people with anorexia seem to recognize that they're hungry. They're getting the signal. They can't turn that signal into motivation to eat and to initiate eating. But they're still, their part of their brain is still recognizing they're they're hungry. And this is a, a strange signal that nobody else has. I suspect that really explains why at the, they're obsessed with food and they cook for others, yet they can't eat. And can you speak a little bit about binge eating disorder? It's a new disorder in the DSM-5, but I think it's one that has a lot of medical consequences. Yeah. A binge eating disorder is, it tends to occur more frequently in males. It's a somewhat later age of onset. And people have, they tend to often have mood and anxiety disturbances and respond somewhat differently to treatment and other treatments compared to anorexia. But etiologically, they're really not the same disorder. Whereas you see bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa kind of run together in families. You don't really see that. Binge eating disorder has a separate kind of family inheritance structure. There's one other disorder that we've recognized now, and that's ARFID, or Avoidant Restricted Food Eating Disorder, which is very extreme picky eating and tends to occur in children. That's something that we treat a lot also. And these are kids, that there's a whole host of different symptoms they have. Some have pain in their stomach and can't eat because it causes pain. Some are very anxious. Some have obsession. They only can eat four different white foods. Some disturbed by certain textures and taste of food. So it's not just one symptom complex. It's something that we've more recently kind of recognized. And some of these children really have a hard time eating and lose a lot of weight. And so it's one of the disorders that we treat. And there's some, some of these children will end up developing anorexia and some just have an ARFID disorder. So it's things that we're learning about, but it's also a disorder where family-based treatment is often very useful. And early intervention as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? Well, you know, I think we're finally becoming a science. The progress that's been made in the last 10, 20 years has just been enormous. And, you know, of course, the reason was that the brain is encased in your skull. There is opposed to having diabetes or heart disease where you can measure things. We haven't been able to measure what's going on in the brain. And it's only been the last decade or so, we've had powerful brain imaging and genetic kinds of studies that are allowing us to really look inside the brain and begin to understand brain circuits and pathways and mechanisms of behavior and how behavior is encoded in the brain that have just made a difference. I'm just kind of astounded how far we've gotten in my professional career where you can begin to look at these behaviors and go like, oh, well, I think this part of the brain is involved and now I understand the mechanism. I can predict what we're going to find and we can replicate those kind of findings. And that's starting to lead to a more effective treatments as we begin to translate that science into therapy. Effective and targeted treatments as well. Yeah, 
And, and, and that's one of the things that we do here. I like to look at our program not only as a, a treatment program, but also a laboratory for developing treatment. So we've been very interested in this whole question of temperament and people with anorexia. And, you know, these temperaments don't go away, but people with anorexia, when they recover, tend to do really well in life. And they learn to use some of these temperaments in really kind of advantageous ways. This is a group of people that are very achievement-oriented. They uh, self-discipline. They pay attention to detail. They work hard. They want to do the right thing. And they often have not just great, but actually spectacular uh, careers. And so this actually turns out to be a benefit to having some of these traits once people learn to use them in advantageous, constructive ways. So we, we think that that may be actually an important insight into developing more effective treatment approaches. That is very exciting. And if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would it be? Being able to understand each person's unique vulnerabilities and mechanisms, because when you really come down to it, people are pretty complicated and everybody has probably uh, in some ways the unique mechanisms that are causing you know, environmental influences. And so that starts to explain why whatever treatment we have works in some people, but not others. And so if we could better understand, you know, it's called precision medicine. If you could better understand each person's unique with a series of factors, you could really more precisely prescribe treatment. We're, we're not there yet. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's going to be a while. Yeah, we'll probably get there. No, we're going to get there because people are going to be yeah. asking for it now. Like I think when we when they hear, yeah, yeah. hear from you and hear all of these exciting targeted treatments, yeah. it's going to kind of create a demand. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Dr. K, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work. I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of eating disorders. And to my listeners, be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.